So welcome to the lecture on stream invertebrates. <clears throat> what I want to do here is walk you guys through just some of the brief key ideas about stream work we're going to be doing, but also go through some of the probably the main organisms, the main macro invertebrates that we're going to see in the stream in the Saboon River when we're down in Belize. That way you guys see them here when we get down there. You already have a background in how to collect these critters and also what a lot of them are. Now, with macroinvertebrates, there is a huge spectrum of diversity out there. We're going to keep it general. We're going to go to larger taxonomic groups, um, usually around the order level, because trying to go down to the species is incredibly difficult. Even for experts, it takes a lot of sitting down with all these specimens and looking at minute little details to get down to the individual genus and species. So again, we're going to stay at the higher taxonomic levels and look at groups like stoneflies, mayflies, etc. Within stoneflies, there's thousands of species. So again, do not worry about trying to identify individual species. We're going to identify them to the group. Now something to keep in mind as we identify to the group there will be variation within that group. So every stonefly we collect may not match exactly the description, but we wanna make sure we're getting all the key features correct. And that's what we'll go through as we get into the individual groups that we're gonna come across in Belize. All right, but before we get to the actual macroinvertebrates, the little critters, let's take a look at some basic stream features. Now what I would encourage you guys to do is fill out this PowerPoint as you're watching it. Don't just watch it and listen. Write out some notes here, type them into the blanks on the PowerPoint, but actively get engaged in a lecture. Just to sit and listen to a lecture is probably the least likely way to be successful with absorbing content. Vast majority of us are not auditory learners, so you don't wanna just sit and listen. You wanna sit, listen, watch, and do. Combine all those modalities of learning and you're going to retain this stuff a lot better. Okay, so key things about the stream. <clears throat> when we look at streams and rivers, we need to look at the different features, the physical features of those bodies of water to get a feel for what kind of invertebrates may or may not be present. Now, one of the factors to look at when we're looking at a stream is what is the water velocity? How fast is that water moving? That influences what diversity lives there. And within the river, in the picture you're looking at, that is the river, that's the Saboon River, that's our sampling site. Within the river, there's gonna be different velocities. If you're on the inside of a bend versus the outside of a bend, if you're in shallow water versus deeper water, and get even, more minute, you have a big, large boulder, water hitting it, what we call the upstream side, a lot of force and turbidity there. The backside of the boulder, it's going to be a little calmer because the water is moving around the boulder. So velocity to water plays a big role in determining what could live there. And that velocity will change throughout the year. Rainy season, dry season, it changes. But anything living there is adapted to the various water velocities that the river will experience throughout the entire year. All right, what kind of bottom does it have? What we call the substrate. Is it sand? Is it gravel? Is it rocks? What we're going to be sampling in are larger river rock. Some of these might be 30, 40 pounds. Others are the size of baseballs. But we have a lot of bigger kind of rocks, boulders in there as a substrate. Makes a perfect place for critters to crawl underneath, hide underneath it, attach to it, or just burrow underneath those big rocks. So that substrate, again, can play a role in influencing what lives in that particular river. Now temperature, we are closer to the headwater of the Saboon River, so it's gonna be cooler that's going to influence biodiversity differently than if we were going down towards the beach or towards the coast where you've had miles and miles and miles of 
distance away from the headwaters for that temperature to increase. Temperature also influences oxygen saturation. Oxygen influences what can live there. So in the United States, our example, trout, they like a lot of oxygen in their water. It's why they don't live in Illinois. They live in high elevation mountain streams, colder water, more oxygen. So think about temperature. Um, sunlight exposure. How much light does that river get? What we're looking at is wide open. It gets a lot of light throughout the entire course of the day, throughout the entire course of the year. So that sunlight can influence temperature, but it can also influence plankton, algae. So photosynthesizers use the sunlight as part of their growth process, their energy production with photosynthesis. That's going to influence what lives there. So you get algae. A lot of the macroinvertebrates feed off of the algae. So all those factors come in together. And the last one to mention is what we call the watershed characteristics. All the land, oh, land that drains into the body of water. All the land that drains into this river is part of collectively known, collectively what we call the watershed. Now where we're at, we don't have a lot of disturbed watershed areas. There's some citrus farming, there's the resort we're at, and there's some other cattle farming, all roughly right in this vicinity of our sample site. But if we go about three miles upstream, it's all jungle. It's jungle, it's mountains, it's natural native environments. So that's going to influence what could potentially come into the body of water at this point. If we go downstream all the way down to the coast and sample closer there, we have lots of additional watershed draining into the river, lots of additional land that will tributary into the river that will contribute to increased nutrient loads, pollution, things like that. Okay, so a lot of stream or river features to be aware of when we're in Belize sampling the Saboon River. So, all right, now, how do animals figure out how to live in this? Well, they have adaptations to live in the water. Now, their body plan has evolved to minimize the impact of the water hitting them. So they're, they're not trying to stop the water. That's just not feasible. It's to minimize the force of the water that hits the animal. So some of the macroinvertebrates will have a flattened body plan. So think about a frisbee. You put that frisbee flat in the water and there's a very small surface area for the water to hit. And then it slides over the top of the frisbee. Don't turn the frisbee on its side because then you have a lot of surface area. So a body plan that's flattened allows the animal to be streamlined to make it a little easier for it to survive in the water. Some of the macroinvertebrates actually have suckers on their legs where they can suction cup onto some kind of substrate, rocks, branches, etc. Sometimes they have them on the underneath side of their body that allows them to attach to things. So you can hang on. If you don't have suckers, you might have claws. And when we collect some of these guys, look at their claws. They are some sharp, scary looking claws. They use those to actually latch on to something, to take all six of their legs with their little claws and just stab it into a log or into the substrate, the algae mats or whatever they're attached to and hang on for dear life. So you got to hold on because that water is not stopping. It's always going to be a constant force that's possibly pushing you off wherever you're trying to attach to. You get pushed out into the stream, you may get washed downstream for miles before you can finally reattach yourself to something. You move downstream three miles, all the environmental or abiotic conditions of the stream may be different 
It might be warmer, it might have more pollution, it might have different predators. Are you gonna be able to survive downstream? You know, you, your species has adapted to this area. Is it adapted to the entire length of the Saboon River? Depends on the abiotic conditions and the species. Uh, some of the critters produce sticky secretions, like little, think about Spider-Man, little sticky threads that they use to wrap onto things and in a sense hold themselves into place. Uh, some of them will use it to actually grab food, but the purpose here is, or this, with this discussion we're talking about, attaching to some kind of substrate to hold yourself in place, like tape yourself or glue yourself to a rock or a log so you don't get washed downstream. All right, this is one of the neat ones. Some of the adaptations or the animals have adaptations where they build houses out of debris. Now the debris could be little pebbles, it could be little pieces of vegetation, branches, whatever. Uh, these are the caddis flies, and we'll see those in a little bit here, <clears throat> where they actually build a little house and they live inside the house. So now the house has weight to it because it's made out of, a lot of times it's made out of pebbles, little rocks that they stick together with these sticky secretions and form a house. That makes it a lot harder for it to get washed downstream. All right, so if you're gonna live in a body of water where there's moving water, you better have different adaptations that enable you to survive in the moving water. If you're in a calm, still lake, whole different ball game. You don't have to worry about water velocity and current. So your adaptations, the evolution of your adaptations is very different. There's overlap for sure, but we do see some specializations within moving water when it comes to body plans and adaptations. So, all right, so let's start talking about the major groups of macroinvertebrates we expect to see in freshwater streams and rivers. And we'll talk about tolerance index, and then we'll also talk about what does it mean if they're there or if they're not there, what concerns should that raise. So, all right, so our first group are the stoneflies. When we look at the stoneflies, stoneflies go in the order Plecoptera. That is a scientific level of classification we're dealing with here is order. So actually, let me put that above here just so everybody's okay with it. So order. So if you guys remember classification, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, and then we have order. We are not going to worry about trying to go down to genus, uh, family, genus, or species. Just too much detail, too, too small of little variations. We're keeping it broad in general again. So the order Plecoptera, these are generically called the stoneflies. The importance here is these guys, when they become adults, they will become flying terrestrial insects. So all of these different macroinvertebrates, not all, the vast majority that we're discussing will actually have a terrestrial form that they <clears throat> emerge into. So they're a great connection between water and land. If there's a problem with the water, it's going to impact what happens on land. When they become winged insects on land, they're a food source for a lot of different mammals, reptiles, amphibians. Think about the whole terrestrial food chain. Frog eats a stonefly, adult stonefly. Snake eats the frog, bird eats a snake, so on. You got a food chain there. You lose this, you got a problem in your food chain. If the water goes bad, you lose these guys. All right, so that's what we want to look at. Now, how do we identify these guys? Well, we're going to talk about the key features of the nymph. Now, the nymph is the form we're looking at right here. This is the body plan of the stonefly when it is in the aquatic world when it's in its aquatic environment. I want you guys to be able to recognize this body plan and say, okay, based on these key features, I know this is a stonefly. I'm not worried about which family, genus, or species, just a general group. So we'll get into that in the next lecture.